My name is Morten Birkel. I'm the chairperson of this PhD defense of Markus, Jan Markus, Uwe Rutger. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, for the defense, we have a group of examiners sitting up here on the first row. First of all, we have um, Dr. Ingenieur Tina Detmer, Volkswagen AG in Germany, and Professor Wim de Wolf, KU Leuven, Department of Mechanical Engineering. Last but not least, <laughs> Associate Professor Stig Erving Olsen from D2 Management Engineering. Um, Jan, you had, oh, Jan Markus, you had uh, a supervisor who is Nikki Bay sitting here. Everyone's present, it seems. <laughs> welcome to all of you, also to Nikki, and welcome to the audience. Um, today you are defending the PhD thesis sustainability assessment in the highly automa uh, automated manufacturing with a presentation of the same name I've heard. Um, the topic of the thesis is uh, a holistic approach of integration of the sustainability assessment in manufacturing with focus on highly automated production processes, correct? Jan <coughs> um, Markus, you did your PhD thesis at DTU Management Engineering Division of Quantitative Sustainability Assessment. Um, I don't know, have there been any other external supervisor not informed about that? It's just <coughs> not evident, I guess it's not the case then. Co-supervisors. We have a co-supervisor, Michael Hauschitz, sitting over there. <laughs> Not to forget. Um, the sequence of what is about to, gonna, to going to happen is that Jan Markus has 45 minutes to give a presentation. Uh, after which we'll have a short break, where some of you might leave, other might need to go to the toilet. And if the auditorium has questions, some of you have questions, Please come to me. I will then make sure that there's time for you to pose your questions. Each, each questioner from the audience is maximum given 15 minutes according to the rules here at the DGU. What I need to allocate in case the examiners decide that they want to go for two minutes or two hours and 15 minutes in total, that will not leave much time for the audience to pose questions. So please approach me in the break in case you have questions. Okay? I will now give the word to you, Jan Markus. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Morten. And I would like to welcome my opponents. And, um, and yeah, like Morten said, my presentation will be um, about sustainability assessment in highly automated manufacturing, introducing, introducing life cycle targets in the early phase of production planning. To understand the whole topic and so forth, I would like to give you a small background or history um, why I actually choose this topic. If we start, um, if we start with global aspects uh, in or global aspects about sustainability, we always have to think about uh, the increase of population until 2050. So, an increase of three million people, we we can actually expect according. Um, to the United Nations. And if we talk about sustainability, most of the people know, of course, global warming. And the IPCC actually says, or the um, Paris Accord says, that we should limit the global warming to um, two degrees Celsius, um, not to, to have a kind of catalyst effect. And if we translate these two degrees Celsius into a target state, we can say, okay, we can still emit 390 to 940 gigatons of CO2 equivalents until 2050. And of course, we have to consider um, the change of transportation around the globe. A lot of people are demanding different means of transportation, additional mobility. And if we 
somehow merge these three aspects uh, in this well-known equation from Commoner. It's the iPad equation. We can, we can somehow identify which might be the lever for decreasing the impact to the environment. So, but before that, I would like to explain this. So if we look here at the population, we will have an increase of 3 billion people until 20, 2050. We have the affluence, which describes somehow the prosperity around the globe. That will increase as well, hopefully. And um, then we have the technology, which is the only lever to at least stabilize the impact to the environment or even reduce the impact to the environment. And if we combine this now to the, the product, which I'm focusing on around this um, um, PhD thesis, we can, we can see it actually today, how this works. So car companies are trying to introduce um, electrified cars now to the market. So they're changing their technology. But does it actually um, reduce the environmental impact uh, by using the electrified cars? So just to remember, um, over a life cycle, a car emits roughly um, 38 tons for 200,000 kilometers and 10 years. And if we look now at electrified cars, there will be a shifting from the use phase of the emissions to the, to the manufacturing stage. But how much can we actually emit? That is the question. So which CO2 budget is actually allowed to have a stable or a lower impact to the environment? That's the whole question of my PhD thesis, how we can combine the global aspects, the product, and the manufacturing and how much CO2 emissions can be assigned to manufacturing. Along this way, uh, the car manufacturers say, yeah, have to solve a lot of challenges or there's challenges ahead. Like um, stakeholders are asking for um, cheap production or politics are asking for the introduction for additional regulations and so forth. And of course, we have to think about the rebound effect as well. So the car companies are always striving for, for, for more cars. They want to sell more cars to earn more money. But this means that we have additional emissions during the production. So this is called the rebound effect. And then we have the planning, um, which um, is kind of important because we have to plan the production line according, according to this new CO2 budget. But the, um, the car manufacturers are producing a lot of variants now. If you look at the golf car 20 years ago, there were only four different kind of variants, and now there are up to 100 available. And then, um, of course, the planning should take less time. It's a kind of economical pressure from the stakeholders. So this is the whole background around uh, of my PhD thesis. And now I'm getting into detail and would like to present um, the agenda. So in the beginning, I will talk about my research approach, then the actual method development. After that, I uh, integrate the method into current assessment methods. Then I will apply it in highly automated manufacturing. So I will generate actually results here. And then at the end, I will finish with the conclusion and recommendations. So let's start with a, with a research approach, which is always uh, quite important in a, in a PhD to do some research. And, and yeah, I would like to um, scope my, my thesis a little bit. So as I mentioned before, I have dealt with the target states, environmental and economic target states, but I will focus on environmental or CO2 emissions in this presentation. So, the first research question I have solved in paper one, actually, how can sustainability assessed in automotive manufacturing using the concept of target states? So the, how to implement 390 gigatons uh, into the production planning. The second uh, part is the product life cycle of the car. And um, it's quite important uh, to, to implement um, this new thinking into existing simulation tools because um, car manufacturers are using a lot of simulation and trying to, to um, speed up the planning process. So I've 
try to integrate life cycle assessment into production simulation to avoid actual sub-optimization. So the burden shifting from one stage, uh, one life cycle phase to the other stage. And then we have the third part, which is about product and production planning. So I had to understand um, the production planning process in car manufacturing and how a target state for production can be integrated in the early phase of production planning. And the last um, question is how I can actually assign these target states to the individual processes in a body-wide production. So what CO2 budget should be assigned to robot XY uh, somewhere in the production line? And after I solved all this or answered all this question, I'm pretty happy that I've developed a sustainability assessment method for automated manufacturing. How I have approached these uh, four questions will be the content of this slide. So the first part is the method development, and it's the answer of research question one. And um, I started with a, or actually the aim was to have a holistic framework for sustainable manufacturing. And I um, did a literary review in the beginning gained a lot of knowledge about how to assess sustainability in, in manufacturing. Then I talked to uh, the partners uh, in the Arias project. And the Arias project is mainly, uh, is a EU funded project which lasts from end of 2013 until 2016. And the idea of the project was to assess um, technologies in highly automated manufacturing. So it somehow fits pretty well to my PhD thesis. And then I analyzed, I was lucky enough to analyze their manufacturing systems. So I gained additional knowledge. And then um, I added up some, or added some sustainability assessment approaches. And at the end, I had a holistic framework. But I will talk about th this in detail later on. The second part is the integration in, uh, in current assessment methods. This method somehow have to be applicable. So I collaborated with the TU Brunswick um, and we combined life cycle assessment and manufacturing simulation uh, in this part, and we were able to integrate this into current um, simulation so uh, software. The last part, which is the most interesting part, I would say, um, is the application in highly automated manufacturing. So I did here a review of production planning of a body shop and collected a lot of primary data in collaboration with the Arias project again and with the University of California. And then I integrated these two, two approaches here and developed at the end an algorithm which can somehow uh, derive life cycle targets for, for the body shop. So the question one um, I would like to answer now is um, how can sustainability assessed in automotive manufacturing using the concept of target states? Um, for me, it was always quite important um, to, to work with industry. So I, of course, we had the key partners here of the Arias project, which were KUKA, Daimler, and Siemens. But along the way, I had the opportunity to talk about my approach with Tesla in California, uh, uh, with Denfors, as one of the partners in areas as well, but not, they were not really into car manufacturing. Um, and, and then with Volkswagen, and yeah, so they were pretty helpful. So I could mirror my approach and see if it's a good approach, a applicable approach, because I wanted to develop an assessment method which can be applied in actual manufacturing environment and not just another method for the draw. So that was my, my idea. And based on this collaboration, um, I was able to derive um, objectives for the new sustainability assessment framework. And in total, um, I have derived four objectives. So the new framework should um, have addressed the full scope of sustainable manufacturing. That means we should relate the impact of the product to the, to the production development then it should reflect uh, global uh, targets like the planetary boundaries concept which somehow uh, describes the carrying capacity of the of the um, of the earth so how much we can actually still emit um, 
then we um, should under or sustainability sustainability should be understood as a relation between three factors the demand from the customers the so-called functionality the product and the production system but it has to take the life cycle perspective always into consideration and then um, it should be able to integrate target states to the very last production station and the second part uh, about the, the background of the, of the new framework is the derived requirements from industry. So it should be aligned to the existing decision-making process. Um, it should um, fit to the ex existing product and production pl planning processes. So it has to be a top-down approach. Then it has to be transparent so that all uh, involved managers know what kind of target they should use then it should incorporate the life cycle approach because the uh, latest um, ISO 40001 sa says that the life cycle approach should be considered. And then we have, um, of course, which is quite important for car manufacturers, not really, uh, they don't really want to have additional workload and it should be built up on existing software. There are a lot of product life cycle management softwares available and the framework should be integratable to this one. And cost-benefit ratio is kind of obvious for, for car manufacturers. And yeah, so the result is the so-called sustainability cone. And if you remember that we should integrate the demand from the customers in this new framework, we're going to start here with a small, um, with a small customer. So, and you are asking for uh, mobility, for example, as a function or transportation. This transportation can be, can, has to be defined. So the, the functional unit has to be defined. The functional unit is quite important in life cycle assessment. So all the results are going to relate to this functional unit. And for example, a functional unit can be 200,000 kilometers of individual transportation over 10 years. And this can be provided, of course, by a car or maybe by an electrified car. And if we now integrate the life cycle concept, we can, we can um, um, assess the environmental impact, which is represented here with the CO2 equivalence. You can see that uh, um, a car emits roughly 38 tons over the life cycle. This number is based on 20 um, analysis, which, are, which were conducted from Volkswagen, Ford, Daimler, and so forth. And that's the median of it. And uh, the manufacturing stage co contributes roughly um, 6.7 tons to the overall emissions, the use phase 31 tons, and end of life zero because most of the car manufacturers uh, are taking the conservative approach because they are quite unsure how, emission, how many emissions uh, can be saved uh, during the end of life phase or will be emitted. So most of the companies are saying, okay, we say zero at this point. But the question is, how much is actually caused by the production system? And if we remember, we would like to introduce these numbers in the planning phase. So how should you know which, how many emissions are produced or caused in the emission in the, um, in the planning phase? And if we go through here, the car body uh, will be produced in a, in a body shop. And the body shop consists of several sublines, like the underbody line or the side member line. And then you have a lot of different um, technologies. Um, to, to join actually the different parts and, and at the end there are a lot of robots in this car body production. To visualize all these, um, all these I've developed the so-called sustainability cone which represents here the functionality, uh, the functional unit as the first level and everything is related to the functional unit and these arrows indicate the life cycle on each stage. And on the far top, it's, it's the product specifications. And, and, and here, down here, the production parameters. And from the top down to the lowest level, there are a lot of decision making um, happening. This is the backbone of, of my thesis. So I try to visualize 
the, the interdependencies between the customer and the robot. But there's still a problem how we can, a methodological a challenge actually, how can we solve the barrier here between the module and the system? Because here we are assessing a, a unit of product and here we are assessing the production of one unit. It's a methodological problem which I would like to solve um, later on. So um, the intermediate or the, the outcome of the method development is that the sustainability cone um, has been designed for industry. So it incorporates existing stage skate model, represents the existing top-down decision-making approach, and it actually reflects the iterative and overlapping product and production planning. So if one, some products are changing, you can go a uh, level up and decide how to um, adjust the carbon budget. And then it embraces the target state concept, so absolute targets can be implemented, and it's able to visualize potential sub-optimizations between the different levels. The feasibility and app uh, applicability in manufacturing <laughs> must be tested, which I will do uh, in the next slides. So the combination between product, uh, with production simulation has to be tested, the integration of life cycle assist, assessment according to ISO 44 as well, 4040, and the available data and manufacturing planning has to be, um, has to be tested or have to, we have to find out if there's enough uh, data available at this point. So the second part is about the integration in current assessment methods. So how can we um, merge life cycle assessment and production simulation um, to avoid sub-optimization. So the sustainability cone again uh, with the a, with a product related um, um, specifications up here. And if we look into detail, we can see the, the life cycle here. So the raw, raw material production um, of the different components of the car, the actual production in the facility, the use and the end of life of the car. But if we want to combine it now with, with the production parameters, we have the problem that we have two interfering life cycles. So the question is, how can we, how can we overcome this barrier in a systematic and applicable way? And I would like to exemplify this uh, at a quite um, easy um, example. So if we're looking now at the process, uh, which is, um, consists of a welding um, step, a clinching um, step, and a laser production step. And based on this process, we are producing one car body. It's quite easy to, to, to generate the results for, for, for this, right? For one functional unit, production of one car body. We can, we can collect all the kilowatt hours along this way and assign this to a product. That's quite, quite handy. But if we look now to all the other components, like the factory itself, with maybe some lighting, some photovoltaics on the roof, some windmills somewhere on the side, how should we assign this to this car body? So the, the idea is that we somehow divide all this carbon footprints and align this to the functional unit. And of course, there's another major impact. Um, it's the machinery. If we think about the, the complex production of car manufacturing, we have a lot of machinery in there, and there's a lot of environmental impact. And we have to consider this as well and align this to the functional unit. And how can we do that in a handy, applicable, and feasible way? That is what we, what we did with a new holistic and applicable assessment method. We've... Um, Develop this um, with the TU branch together. Uh, if anyone is interested in manufacturing simulation, you should go there. It's a pretty good group. And um, we started with the idea that we want to combine manufacturing simulation as the driving force because the, com uh, the industry is always looking for um, improvements in the manufacturing, in the actual production line. And we said, okay, that is the driving force right here. So we're going to simulate the manufacturing system and we will um, get some, some energy data out of it. But if we remember the whole factory picture from the slide before, we have to add machine tools and equipment as well and HVUC and lighting to get the full picture. 
And that is why uh, we use the life cycle assessment um, approach. So we define the goal and scope. And this is more or less the um, life cycle model. The next uh, part was um, to, or the next part of a life cycle assessment is to, to have a life cycle inventory. And how did we do this? We defined some parameters which somehow pull all the information based on the predefined functional unit out of that databases. So for example, uh, if we have one photovoltaic um, unit on, on the roof, the, the actual um, CO2 emissions are stored here in this um, database like EcoInvent or Garvey. And then the manufacturing simulation says, okay, I need this specific share of one unit of um, solar panel. And then we have assigned it to this. And this happens with all the other machinery as well, depending of course on dynamic aspects and so forth. But this is, uh, um, it would be a whole, whole other presentation if we talk about this. And at the end, we have to add, oh, the result of this is actually a material flow analysis, so an inventory, and we can assign the environmental um, impact assessment at the end, and by using a midpoint assessment method, which is based on CML. And um, yeah, by this, we were able to assess five different impact categories for, for these kind of um, manufacturing systems. So. And at the end, of course, there's an interpretation if, it's, if it makes any sense, these results. And yeah, the outcome, I would say, for, for, for merging these two um, approaches is that the challenge of two interfering life cycle cycles is solved by using the functional unit approach, assigning everything to the functional unit. And, but it requires substantial knowledge of the process because everything is manual so far. It's not automatized, and we haven't integrated it in, into PLM systems and so forth. And we can say that production-driven assessments are possible. And we can basically as, um, avoid sub-optimization between manufacturing, overhead, and the process. So we have the full picture and can see the different shares and see min, um, so different shares for machinery and infrastructure, direct energy consumption, or indirect energy. Yeah, and I would say it's possible to have now a, a holistic assessment, and uh, this actually leads to more effective solutions, which I think is quite important, because efficiency improvements in manufacturing not always lead to effective solutions. So. If you, for example, integrate renewable energies into the production system, you need storage systems, for example, which have additional environmental impact. And by this approach, we can see the whole picture and say, okay, um, effective or efficient solutions are not always effective. And the third one is now the most interesting part, I would say. It's about the application in highly automated manufacturing. And we have to, answer, or I would like to answer two questions here. So how can a target state for a production be integrated in the early phase of production planning? So we would like to understand how it works, the production planning in car manufacturing. And the fourth question is how we can integrate target states um, and assign them to individual processes. So we can use um, life cycle target setting in production planning. And to understand the, the, the case I, would, uh, I will present later on, um, we I would like to focus now on, on, on this area. So um, the car body is not, will now be the case. And the car body is produced in a body shop, like I said before, with an underbody line, spot welding, and robot. And if we assign now a life cycle target here uh, to the car body, or I would call it from now on life cycle target because it includes the whole life cycle of the car body. Um, what does it mean for the robot X, Y at the end of the, uh, at the end of the line? So how can we uh, allocate this in a transparent and consistent way? So if we look now at a typical stage gate model in, in car production, um, we can see here 
the whole whole flow more or less the strategy uh, development here and the um, start of production up here in um, in general i would say it takes roughly uh, 60 months from product concept to the start of production but of course they would like to to shorten it now and it's maybe maybe four years now in yeah but just to understand um, first of all there is a strategy development so what kind of car do we need for the different market what are the customers are demanding what kind of car so suv is a huge topic now so they are producing all the um, utility vehicles and the next step would be the product concept so that is what you see at all the different um, car fairs in, in frankfurt and so forth there are a lot of nice concepts and then actually the production planning takes place and so between the 16th and the 46th month before the start of production so that is where i would like to implement my my um, allocation method this is a little bit uh, wrong here i should move this to month uh, 46 i'm sorry about that but um, to un understand the production of, of a car i would like to show you uh, um, this um, graph and usually the production starts in the press shop, then the body is produced, then it moves to, to the paint shop, then the powertrain um, will be attached, and then the final assembly. These are the five steps. But I will focus on the body shop because um, um, it is the second biggest uh, energy consumer in car production after, after the paint shop. Then, but there's a lot of infrastructure um, which is used. So if, if we think about all the robots in there and, and so forth, they need a lot of area. If you go to a car manufacturing um, facility, there are robots everywhere, more or less. And um, on the other hand, um, the body shop is one of the key uh, competences still from the car manufacturers. So they, they are producing their, their actually car. So they are not um, um, giving that to external partners and so forth. They're still producing that by themselves. So that is why I choose actually the body shop. And of course, I could collect a lot of data uh, in the areas project. If we look now to uh, um, in a body shop, it's usually uh, separated in three different lines. So the underbody structure, the, um, the two, the assembly where the underbody is joined with the roof and the upper back and at the end the doors and the fenders are attached to give you an overview how this actually looks like we can say that in general 500 different parts are joined along this process here um, up to 500 cars uh, can be produced in this kind of line um, but i would say it's between 250 and 500,000. the cycle time ranges between 40 and 60 seconds. So every 60 second, a new car body is coming out of this line. The degree of automation is uh, 98%. So, yeah. And the availability has to be higher than 95%. If we talk about primary energy consumption, we can say that 50% is due to the movements of robots and 50% for other consumers. If we now look at, at the robots, we can uh, say that in total, two, 1,200 robots are installed in this line, and it's increasing. So the last, uh, if we look at the at the um, at the International Federation of Robotics, they um, said that six years ago there were an average 700 robots installed. So every product cycle there will be more robots. I don't know where the end is, but uh, 1,000 robots is is a lot. And if we um, think about that a robot has a similar carbon footprint like a car, it's, it's huge. It's a huge impact. And so the every, uh, average energy consumption per robot is uh, 4,500 kilowatt hours per year. It's, it's roughly one and a half households, I would say, just to, to um, get an idea how much it is but it only works 90 percent of the overall time the reason for that is the organization of the production line to secure the highest availability 
If you look here at the call line, zone one, which is uh, working almost 24 seven. So the robots are working all the time. And um, so there are a lot of, there's a lot of energy consumption here. We can have a look here now at zone two, where medium parts uh, are joined to larger parts. So they are actually providing all the time um, products to zone one. Then we have a logistics area around here. So some products are coming from external uh, sources and so forth, and they have to be integrated here. And then we have the small parts around here where most of the employees are actually still um, working. So they are um, providing, I know, a small metal sheet to, to, to uh, process um, with their hands. So you, we can say that the activity level decreases from zone one to zone three. And in average, only 90% of the time the robots are working. But if we're thinking about here, it's almost 100%. And this is how it would look like in the real world. Um, here in the middle, you can see the high robot density. So that is zone one, the call line. Then we have the zone two, which actually provides some parts. And then we have the zone three, where you can see some low cost automation, which are called uh, in the data sheets from the car manufacturers LCA. So there was a huge confusion when we um, made the first workshops. We're going to talk about LCA and then we started with life cycle thinking. So no one knew what we are talking about because they expected we're going to talk about low cost automation. <laughs> so that was quite funny at Daimler. Anyway, um, we can say a lot of infrastructure, machinery and area is needed. You can see it here. And yeah, but for my, um, for my carbon budget allocation, I need, of course, some data. And that is what I would like to talk about now. So um, we, yeah, the OEMs, the car manufacturers, have a general layout between the 16th and 46th month available. So I'm getting this kind of, of overview. And they're actually saying what kind of intermediate products are handled in this, in this line. And then they describe the general product flow. So how are they gonna join all the different components here? So the joining sequence will be described. You can see here some, some numbers, for example, the cycle time of 45 seconds. And um, yeah, so I have to extract these numbers somehow to get my uh, allocation method. <coughs> But there's more information available if we are looking more into detail. They even describe the different subsells here. And they say what kind of components are used in this, in this um, area. So Modul Rob Punktschweißen means robot spot welding. This is maybe this one. And then we have a table, which is this one. And yeah, so I'm getting a lot of information what kind of machinery is used. And in total, I was able to identify 34 different joining and handling te technologies like welding, adhesive bonding, laser, and clinching. And then 61 different components were identified like table turning machines. But there, were, there, were, there was no weight assessed uh, to the different components, no space or required space they need or installed capacity, how much electricity they will use. So I had to look up all, all this in the different um, product sheets and yeah, assigned all this information to the different components here. The next part is, um, um, or the, the idea was actually to, to develop a method which is applicable to production, uh, product lifecycle management tools, simulation tools to, to increase the applicability. And in these um, software tools, it's usually uh, separated. The information is usually separated into three parts, product, process, and resource related. And I wanted to assign my, my data, which I've collected in the data sheets to those. So product related, I have the number of parts which I, tr uh, which I handled in this process. Then I have the weight of the different products and the dimension. And the process as well, where I have processed data as well, the cycle time, the joining sequence, and the joining equivalent. 
The joining equivalent is, is, is kind of key for my, um, for my assessment because it compares two different joining technologies based on, on a specific number. If we look at spot welding with a specific stiffness for one spot um, and we want to use another technology like laser, how much of laser do we need to, have to get the same stiffness? So the car manufacturers invented their own equivalents and for, for laser, for example, it's that we need 10 millimeters of laser to achieve the same stiffness like one spot weld. So it's, a, um, it's possible to compare different technologies. If we talk about now resource-related data, we have the technology. Uh, two different kinds are used, joining and handling. And then we have the components, um, like tables, fans, and so forth. And we have the employee, um, which I mentioned here, in this data sheets as well. Yeah, and then um, I said, okay, how can we describe actually the new allocation method? And I said, yeah, somehow it, all the data describes the activity of the different lines. So I called it activity-based allocation, a top-down approach. So because I'm getting the data from the whole line and then further down, it's a sub line, so I call it a top-down approach. The allocation method integrates a typical production line structure, so line one to three, and so all subordinated levels. It defines factors for product, process, and resource-related activity, and it's more or less compatible with PLM system architecture because of the clustering. It represents the stage gate model, so it's somehow, uh, I use all the data from in the, between the month 60 and 46. And um, I'm only extracting um, data um, which already exist, and it's an automatic extraction. In, in a huge extra sheet, I put all the information and then I'd, I have to press the button and all the information is getting out. And it's applicable due to the similarity to, to cost target setting. If we think about how a, a car is, is planned, you always have a, a financial budget on the top, and then it will be allocated to the different lines or to the different managers. So my kind of thinking is almost the same. And it's able to define process, overhead, and infrastructure targets. And it uh, encompasses life cycle assessment. Um, but this is a lot of talking now, so I would like to um, <laughs> I would like to use all this information here in this case study. It's a quite easy one. So if we look at line one, which I've shown you before with the zone one and zone two, and the line two, which looks quite different. And we say, okay, we have a carbon budget now available and would like to somehow split it. So how much of the target state should be assigned to each of them in the planning phase? So to know if if the product line developer is in the right direction to fulfill the uh, target state. So that's the, that's the question. And can the available data be combined to arrive in profound allocation factor? These are the main questions. And now it's getting a bit cryptical, but I hope you're, you're fine with it. And um, so, if we look at this formula here, it's described somehow the product activity. So you're setting, you're looking at the different number of products in line one, which I handled here, so the product flow, and line two with three numbers as well. If you're wondering what TLL means, it's a, it's a technology readiness level, which I um, used in this approach as well, because some, some um, lines are well developed, it's quite mature, mature, so it has a low um, uncertainty. So it's getting a nine. If it's a high uncertainty, it's only getting a one. So we have a lot of, um, a lot of um, additional planning to do. So we have, uh, we have uh, three different products which are handled in each of the lines. The mass of the different products is here, uh, 120 kilograms and 250 kilograms into line two. The dimensions, uh, is, are, are similar and then at the end we are put and if we're putting all the numbers in here we can say that the product activity factor is 1.32 in line 1 and 1.68 in line 2 
Yeah. We can do this um, with the process as well. I don't want to get into detail, but I've considered the cycle time here, the joining equivalence, and the joining sequence. So how many um, steps are, are necessary along this, uh, along this um, production line. And we can say, see that the process activity is higher uh, in line one compared to line two. Resource related is a bit more complicated, but it's because um, we have to consider um, energy consumption and so forth as well. And, but in general, it's the same approach. So we looked at the um, involved technology, involved components, and the employees. The employees are treated equally to technologies. So that is the, that's the idea that one robot equals one human. And, and at the end, we have a resource activity allocation factor of 1.3 for unit one and 1.6 uh, for line two. And yeah, but we need an additional factor to somehow consider the, um, the resource intensity. So I've looked at the different weights of the different technologies here. So I uh, identified that the weight of the machinery is 32 tons in line one and 43 tons in line two. In total, it, uh, they consume 250 cubic meters compared to 335 cubic meters in line two. And um, line one consumes uh, one megawatt hour uh, compared to 1.3 megawatt hours. So technology acti um, activity is allocated with 1.3 to line one and 1.7 to line two. So I can say, I'm, or I'm happy to say, that for each cluster line cell, an individual activity-based factor can be derived. Now we have to compa uh, combine these three factors. So just to remember, these are the different factors. And then we have to add them and divide it by nine because they are treated equally. So I was not able to say that uh, the product is more important than the process or the resource is more important than the, the, the production parameters. Of course, we can, we can change this later on, but it's not up to me. It's more to, to the internal effects of the car manufacturers. So we are having now the life cycle target for both lines. And then we apply this uh, allocation factor here and we can say, okay, line one is getting 149.5 of, of the, carbon, the carbon budget and line two, 155.6. So for each line, subline cell, an activity-based target is assigned based on all the planning data we have. Ah, oh, 40 seconds, okay. And um, uh, if we look now at the sustainability cone again and apply all this, thinking to the whole chain which I presented before, right? We started with 3.1 tons of CO2, CO2 equivalents. Sorry about the missing CO2 equivalents here. We can allocate based on different data, the different flows here, but we always have to follow now the, the blue one, right? I don't want to get into detail. Maybe we have the opportunity later on to talk about this, but now we talk about the production itself. And if we look at the system and system and line, we have the 305.2 kilograms, which I presented before. And based on all the information, I assigned here another um, target because it's a different line. And I've split it them a lot here. And, but the idea is I want to get even a level further down. So we're here now on, on line level, then technology is down here with 3.2 kilograms and the technology is basically spot welding. So I was able to uh, derive different targets here. Some are, um, some are attached to stationary um, production and some are attached to robots. So I've, I was able to, to derive different um, targets here as well. But at the end, I was able to derive the life cycle target of a robot. And, and it's quite consistent because I'm always using the same same data which is available um, at this planning stage. And if we compare these results, these are top-down results, right? I used all the planning data. But if we compare those with the with a, um, bottom-up results from, from our Arrails project or another Audi study, we can say 
um, that my results are quite quite good because it's 3.9 grams for material in production and the um, life cycle assessment from Arias and Audi says it, it should be between 3.6 to 5.6 grams of CO2 equivalents per functional unit. And the use I've um, here is 24.6 and they say it's 26 to 27. But the reason might be that I assumed uh, another cycle time and um, the movement was a little bit different maybe. But I would, I would say in general, I'm getting into the um, right direction. Now I would like to conclude and do some recommendations. And the conclusion one is that about method development. I would say um, the framework has been designed along um, existing stage gate model. So read, present actually the car manufacturers, combines the demand from customers with the product and production, and it supports effective planning in a applicable and consistent way. And it visualizes actually all the different um, interdependencies on several levels and includes the life cycle approach. The integration and current assessment methods um, due to the combination of manufacturing simulation and life cycle assessment, we were able to achieve um, a holistic simulation of manufacturing systems. And we actually used the functional unit to overcome the barrier between product and production. And we were able to integrate, integrate dynamic manufacturing effects like um, provision of renewable energies to bend, uh, depending on the um, time in the day. And we were able to individualize um, the life cycle assessment. So we can, we can um, provide product specific life cycle assessment results. Conclusion two is the application in highly automated manufacturing. So the target states, the two degrees um, um, target can be broken down now uh, in the early stage of production planning. And we can assign targets to the individual processes. Um, and it's based on, on typical available data in the automotive companies at a very early stage. And we can integrate the algorithm into existing planning tools. So I, I at least try to provide all the information according to the PLM system um, structure. And it enables managers, product and production planners to keep focus on effective solutions, not just um, focusing on efficiency improvements um, in their specific field. And it allows decisions to be analyzed holistically and thus address potential trade-offs. Limitations are always there. And um, of course, I always needed more time and more, more case studies and so forth, but I'm quite happy. But anyway, um, the goal was to develop an applicable method. However, there was limited data. So I always ask for, for more data from the car manufacturers, but they are not so easy, I would say, with data sharing. So I'm quite happy that I went, uh, that I get some data from the Arias project. The approach is only based on Arias, like I said before, and the support of two further OEMs. So I explained how I did that, and they said, okay, that sounds reasonable. Okay, we can do this and so forth. And yeah, so I'm not completely, I've not developed the method in the complete wrong direction. The focus was on European circumstances, and I've developed it only along the body-wide production. Maybe the approach doesn't work really for, for, um, for, for the paint shop, but yeah, that might be another um, topic. And the combination of life cycle assessment and manufacturing simulation was tested manually. And um, yeah, and the actual implementation in a production development process is missing. We actually tried that with Delmia, with one of the partners, but yeah, there was a lack of time, so we not did that. And one of the drawbacks is actually that, um, or disadvantages is that I only focus on global warming potential and primary energy demand because of the missing time and of course of, of lack of data from, from the industry. And um, yeah, and I can say that, um, that, yeah, that the burden shifting between different impact categories cannot be excluded by my category, only between global warming potential and primary, primary energy demand.
yeah, further development, I would like to integrate it into manufacturing planning software to increase applicability, limit the time effort, and other impact categories I would like to look at, but it needs um, additional data from the car manufacturers, so we should set up a, a project, an industry project with different car manufacturers, and I would like to combine those with, uh, yeah, and combine uh, those um, new data with the algorithm and adjust the algorithm accordingly. Yeah, and I would, yeah, I would like to improve or minimize the sub-optimization between impact categories. And yeah, and it should be tested in other parts, like I've mentioned before, in in in, mm, in the paint shop, for example, and um, yeah, and identify if this kind of thinking is applicable to other sectors, and develop a sector-specific allocation factor. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, and I'm happy to receive some questions. <laughs> Uh, we have two hours and five minutes for that, and I would like to give the floor to the examiners now. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Uh, you have decided on a schedule on how you are going to pop the questions, and maybe you should present the schedule, or are just going to test it out? We, we don't have a kind of a fixed schedule in that way. We decided to go on, on topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, it's not like uh, we do it person by person, but more. Okay. No. Well, maybe I um, I start um, by by referring to the the, the targets. Um, I had another equation in mind, but when uh, you were presenting um, mm. slide twenty eight, um, there you already gave. Well, some some examples of mm -hmm. how you could fill out this this conceptual uh, framework. Now, um, you also mentioned well. Basically, if I look at the the, the equation, um, the first one, for example, it's um, an equal sum. There is an equal weight on mm -hmm. the the three different terms, uh, which are which are well, quite different. Um, in, in, in meaning, mm -hmm. uh, this one on, on the mass, I think, and one on yeah. the dimensions. Mass, number number um, of products, mass of number, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. mass so of products and dimensions. What, yeah. what, what is the consequence of the, the decision of saying, well, I take an equal weight here? What is, what why is an equal weight? Um, or do you see any solutions on, um, on, on, on refining on, that? Mm, or? Um, it's a pretty good question in, uh, and tough one, but um, I would say I was, in general, I, I asked myself um, which part is more important. So, and then I put on the um, Googles from, from a production planner and I said, mm, if I change the importance of the number, um, it means that somehow the mass of the of of the of the product is more more important, like the number of 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 products. So it doesn't match at all. So if you change one, it somehow interferes with the with the other one. You somehow have to have an, an weighting factor for the mass as well and for the dimension as well. So you somehow deduct all. So it doesn't make any sense if you if you make eighty percent. Um, <coughs> there, but somehow I tried to cover it with the TIL, so it's um, the uncertainty, more or less. Mm -hmm. So if the production planner doesn't know um, is it two or three uh, parts, it's uh, higher uncertainty. So I somehow weighted this, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not able to do a weighting factor, because I'm not so into this production planning But at this it, stage. Yeah. Would it be possible <coughs> in, in future to uh, yeah. to find some some oh, correlations, oh, oh. I guess. Right? A correlations, uh, yeah. You can maybe even limit process um, related or product related activity. Maybe you can limit it to to one, because you can say, okay, 
the mass equals the number. But if you look at the car body, if you have a huge um, side frame, uh, which is one product, which should be joined with a, with a fender or whatever, and then you have the mass, which at this point is maybe 250 kilograms for one part, and then the correlation between parts is not possible, but maybe the correlation within the different cells, because you know that the typical product might be this size and this dimension. You know? So, in, in general it's possible, but I think it should be up to the actual production line developer in a later um, stage, because at this point we only have this information, and if we look at months, month 40, where you can actually say, okay, I'm ready to um, have the tender, right? Um, at this point, maybe you can even adjust the importance. No. But at this early stage, it's, I would say it's not that meaningful. I, I would, would um, um, consider looking to, to historical mm. data of, of uh, yeah, plans from the future, products mm -hmm. from the future, uh, from, from the past, sorry, um, yeah. and um, yeah, look at these different parameters mm. and see whether the, the energy consumption in production, yeah. for example, <laughs> could call, be call related rate. somewhere yeah. to, to that one. That's true. You can you can add that. That's yeah. that's true. But it's of course it's always yeah lack of of data availability. Mm -hmm. And if you if you would have done an industry PhD and work at Volkswagen or Daimler directly, it would be possible I think to collect this data. Yeah. But but I would say it's even more interesting uh, in the second part. Uh, so the the production planning itself is always a three step approach. Mm -hmm. So the first part is, that is what I presented here. The second part is that you actually say, okay, I need, I will get robot um, KR210 from KUKA. Mm -hmm. And well, for this other um, process, I need the KR270 because I need an additional uh, payload. That is the, the second step. And the third one is actually the suggestion from the suppliers. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should implement this additional um, information in the second step. So, because here you're just defining the general targets, and I don't know if it's if it's so handy at this point. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, you can. No, yeah, but it's just because I had exactly to this uh, yeah. equations, mm -hmm. equations uh, but it's for the resources. Uh, yeah. Could you go back? Uh, I, th I think just one slide. No. This one, yeah. Well, just one about the CRLs for ah, okay. the CRLs for these equations, and especially for the resources. I don't, I simply don't understand how because well, in the in the in the first you had different CRLs numbers, and here you also have. Wow, yeah, that's, a, that's a coincidence. That's. <coughs> uh, I just said okay. Line one is more the resource. Um, resources are. Um, it, there's a higher uncertainty about the design of the line. So I just want to show... Um, but that was different when you were in the in, in, in equation number one. It was the other way around, or also in, in two. Yeah, so that is... Um, it's quite um, certain that we're going to use three products here at this stage. Right? So that indicates... We have three products. Here. Yeah, okay, so and then it's, it's quite certain that yeah, we yeah, have okay, three right, at this. Right. It's yeah. a little bit uncertain about the, of the mass of the product because the product developers are still changing uh, the actual look of this part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not it's okay. It's okay. just because it's, it's, I think it's a little bit different than how I, how I understand TRL. Okay. Um, but good that we are now on the same page. Yeah, <laughs> but how does the TRL then show up in the final allocation factor? And the final allocation factors, I basically um, um, <coughs> add, it's a, it's a range, right? So this is the median, and I said, okay, 96% of this and 1.04% of this. So that is the range, okay. right? I, I haven't shown it here, but it's, it's basically the range because I cannot say, okay, you have to be in, uh, you have to have one kilogram, it can be 104 or um, 0.6 kilograms, right? Just a range. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think this, that this target setting is a very interesting point. And my question is a bit more general, I mm -hmm. would say. Um, I think that with your activity-based factors, you have chosen an egalitarian approach, let's say it like that. So mm. it's more contraction, so um, everyone has to reduce emissions to the mm. same degree. And I wondered what your reasons were for that, because, of course, there are many other options. You could have said that let's optimize there where there is a highest cost-benefit ratio mm. or so on. So that would interest me why you choose that That everyone, everyone should reduce by the same amount. That's, um, that's basically not completely true. <laughs> um, let us, let's 11. Um, okay, so what I was, so my, my approach was um, to, if we consider the IPID equation and relate that to, to the product. We would like to say, okay, it's 38 tons, it's a target, and um, this is the uh, impact. So, and I would like to reduce it by 10% um, because uh, we would like to comply with a global target mm -hmm. state. It should, uh, it's 10% more or less here. But it doesn't say or doesn't mean that manufacturing has to reduce, be reduced by 10% or, or the use stage. You, we, you can easily yeah. swap, okay. yeah. right? And, and so it, we talk about the vertical integration. So up here we have a target and then it will be integrated down here. But maybe the technology line, for example, cannot comply with, with the new target. That is, that is the most, that's the benefit of this. We can actually say, okay, this should be your target, but then the manager of the technology says, I'm not able to fulfill this. I'm not able to fulfill this with this cost benefit or with this cost. I'm not, it's not possible. Therefore, I can easily go a line, uh, a level up and say, okay, I'm not able to fulfill this. Please find another solution. So this manager says, that technology manager number two, can you somehow fulfill this? And then we can somehow swap the budget from one line to the other. But before we were unable to have this discussion, right? No one knew how much budget they have in terms of CO2, CO2 equivalents or primary energy demand. So it's a starting point to start the discussion. Okay. So, so it's, we have to talk about the vertical integration. So what I'm doing, setting the carbon budgets for the different levels, and then the horizontal discussions between the different line managers. Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm not able to do this. But before, we were not able to have this discussion in terms of environmental impact. Okay, I understand. So that definitely will raise a lot of awareness yeah. among all the levels, I guess. Yeah. But also, I think it might introduce a lot of effort Mm -hmm. for the, those discussions and one could argue that you could simply look at where are the biggest inefficiencies mm -hmm. and then we start improving there mm -hmm. and compensate somehow between the other steps. Mm -hmm. But what, what does it mean if you want to um, reduce the inefficiency? So um, uh, the uh, most, one of the wise. best examples is high pressure air, right? So we, are, we have a lot of leakage and so forth. So, and if we would like to reduce this, what does it mean? So do we need additional uh, software to, to, um, to somehow measure it? Do we need additional um, uh, equipment and so forth? Mm -hmm. And does it really compensate uh, the additional effort for, for the production of the equipment and the additional energy we need to measure the leakage? So the question is, yeah, we need to have the full picture to and find an effective solution. So, yeah, of course, it's always good to to um, identify hotspots and the low-hanging fruits, but high-hanging fruits is another story, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. uh, well, well, related related to this, the um, uh, the compressed air, uh, mm -hmm. for example, and the entire system with uh, with the leakages yeah. uh, you refer to. Um, what I was wondering, um, do you um, also 
allocate the, the, the energy consumption um, completely to the, the, the lowest level there because at, at your plant, well, there, there's a certain level at mm. which you have one compressed air yeah. uh, network. Um, mm. is, it, is it correct that also that impact is in the targeting, in the target setting, uh, allocated completely to, to the lowest level? Um, um, so, it's a question of level of detail. Mm -hmm. So, um, I tried um, to explain it here because it's the uh, lowest level down here. Mm -hmm. But if we now look, for example, here at the use stage, it's the energy consumption for the um, for the for the movement of the robots. So that's the kilowatt hours for the movement. But if we look a little bit further here, the technologies, right? So if we have a, a clamping device or someone is grabbing something, you need a pressure, pressured air. Mm -hmm. So you can actually allocate the, this target into um, for pressured air mm -hmm. because we know how much in general um, is, is used by this device. So we can split this uh, arrow as well. Yeah, but if you if we want to look even further, I have to. Oops. Oh, it's not. How can we make that? Wait a minute. Um. Some other formulas. <laughs> um. But um. You can see here, for example, uh, direct technology activity. So we have a direct energy consumption, which somehow relates to the to the um, compressed air. Oh, I have to stand the whole time. Um, uh, direct energy consumption, then the joining equivalence, and the actual time. So I'm I'm able to to consider this at that point. Yeah. I hope it's okay. Yeah, but I didn't want to present this because then, yeah, it would be more than an hour. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still curious a little bit about back, to, back to what Gina was mm -hmm. asking for, which I'm not sure, still, still not sure I understand. Uh, if you have a target, mm -hmm. say, okay, now you, you mentioned that, that this 38 tons, yeah. right? I, I didn't know that, I, that that's, that's the reduced target. See, this is what you can do for the functional unit. Yeah. If, if so you that, that to, is you need that to reduce mm -hmm. this amount. Yeah. Today it's 38, so that is state of the art more or less. And um, and then you can you, you can say, okay, I would like to have a target state of 35 yeah. to comply with some political uh, decisions. Okay. But but uh, I don't see how. But uh, I think you already mentioned it actually. This you, you say all the time. You don't you avoid self optimization, but hmm. I don't understand how how? Do you, how do you identify the hotspots? How do you identify? How do you see here that it's not more efficient to use a plastic bumper uh, rather than a steel bumper, and use the uh, technologies to produce that instead of uh, the technologies to produce a steel bumper? I I, must, I, I don't see how this is. Uh, uh, it's done. Within okay. the, your, your, your framework, actually. Mm. Mm -hmm. Give me one more second. Um. How? Okay. Let's. How? Okay. Let's let's say we have line one and line two. We have two managers who are meeting uh, on Friday afternoon, and they want to know. Oh, they say okay. We have 1,000 euros to develop this or to set up this, and the other one has uh, 2,000 euros. And then the other one says, okay, um, but we should comply with a um, CO2 reduction of 10%. That is what uh, our CEO said. What, what uh, kind of impact does it have on our production line development? And um, based on this method, we can say, okay, 1,000 euros for the development of line one equals 1,000 kilograms. And the other said, okay, I'm, 
I'm getting 500 kilograms. And um, we have now these two numbers. And, um, and then the other um, one of them says, OK, but my technology is so mature, I cannot comply with this. It's less than 10%. It's, it's, I just can com uh, say I can reduce 1%. And then the other said, OK, my technology is not so mature. I can easily um, reduce um, by 20%. So in total, we are having this 10% reduction. And this is the actual way of discussion um, uh, how we can um, fulfill the, the target from the upper level. So in, in the beginning, we have 1,500 kilograms. 1,000 to the left, 500 to the other one, but based on my based on my allocation method. But they say, okay, I'm not possible to comply with this. Can you do this? Okay, I can do this. So, but we are still fulfilling the upper target, right? And this is why we are not uh, we are able to avoid suboptimization because this has a lot of it would mean a lot of effort to reduce by 10 percent here, but the other part can easily. Um, yeah. And solve this with less and, um, well, what economical. Is, what, what, if it, what, if, what if it wasn't these two that were relevant? What if it was the third that line that was relevant to actually achieve a much mm. higher reduction in the mm -hmm. target? Yeah. Where does that come into? To we have here a system, the production system of a car body. We have the target, right? Yeah. And then <coughs> here are three different lines. We have three different line managers. So that is the normal hierarchy of a production planning process system line developer, and then we have the guys who are uh, in charge of it. Three different lines, and then different um, sublines, and so forth. So these guys can say, OK, we are having 305 kilograms. And the allocation said, OK, we split it this way, and we are developing it into the, this direction. But at some point, they say, OK, it's not possible to achieve the target. So these three guys are discussing who can achieve this target. Do you have some additional um, reduction potential? And by this, we can actually fulfill the upper target here. Yeah. So you're, it's not, a, you're not getting my question, actually. No. I'm, so, I'm sorry if I'm. <laughs> no, no, <that's laughs> but you're not getting my question. My question is what if it's a totally different car that you, that you need to fulfill this target? Completely. So you need, you need different production lines than what you already have identified. Mm -hmm. So where does that come into the. To the Equation here. Ah, okay. Oh. That's that's actually a discussion up here. So it's uh, not down here because we is, are we, it we is, are. It is. It, it does to a large extent also go mm. vertical, right? Because it yeah. requires different lines, different technologies, yeah, yeah. perhaps different materials. If we talk about a different product, um, maybe not a different product, maybe perhaps, but perhaps a, a new way of, of perhaps a, a product will, that has been modified somehow. Mm. So Golf 2.0 compared to Golf 1.0. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that is um, the product-related target. Yeah. And one solution is that we are setting a different target on the far top. So instead of 35, we say, OK, this 2.0 version gets uh, 33 tons. And then using more or less the same production line, because it's kind of flexible. But, um, but if we want to go more into detail at the system level, um, which, which one is it? If we want to look the data sheets, which slide was it? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There it is. 23. So we can we can consider this because if we look here at the different um, intermediate products which are used for a specific product, um, we we only um, we only uh, calculated for this uh, Golf 1.0, but if we look at the Golf 1.2.0, there will be different information. So we get a different proce process product and resource related um, um, allocation factors. Uh, so yeah, 
I know what you're asking for. So two different products in the same production line. How do we allocate the between the different products? Yeah, I, I think maybe, maybe me who is not uh, really... Uh, same terms? Oh. Yeah. Um. I somehow understand it could be, for example, that the car manufacturer decides, okay, we want to reduce our emission targets by, let's say, 30%, whatever, mm. and then we say, okay, we have this segment mm. where we are earning really a lot of money. We mm. don't want to save or do any um, measures there, but mm. we have a lower budget segment, and there it's easy for us to, to invest, and then we get a uh, high output of safe CO2 emissions. Mm. Um, could that be also be solved with your cone? So yeah, I only, there's, there's I, I only looked at the body shop so far. So okay. that is where my allocation method is, is starting. Uh, I've mentioned that in the limitation that I should yes, look at, at the press shop and the, and the um, paint shop as well. So I don't know how we can allocate this between these um, mm -hmm. sections uh, within the company. That is one of the limitations, of course. And um, so, of course, um, paint shop is one of the most energy intensive um, parts, so we know and it's quite mature, so um, a lot of people are trying to, to solve this with a lot of um, um, economic or financial input. So maybe maybe somewhere else there are low-hanging fruits compared to the body mm -hmm. shop. But I'm not. This topic is not about okay. um, how we should optimize it. It's more about actually we know now where are the low-hanging fruits, where where is the biggest budget, and we can develop it in, in a way to comply with mm -hmm. it. That's the idea, not how to optimize it. Okay. Then probably just one, perhaps I just didn't get the point right. Um, you said that you were solving the interfering life cycles um, yeah. with a functional unit. So yeah. relating everything to the functional unit, mm -hmm. that would be used for the LCA. Mm -hmm. um, does it also mean that you um, define the life cycle of the tool so that you say, I assume that not just one car generation is produced with these robots, but two or mm -hmm. so. And how did you define their lifetime, or how did you do that? Um, yeah, the lifetime of, of of a robot, for example, is uh, is uh, considered as as six years so far, uh, because I talked to a lot of OEMs and they said, well, we have no clue what we are doing afterwards with the robots. Some of them are reused in 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 other. Um, parts because they don't need the accuracy anymore at this point because the most important thing is the accuracy in the robot and but we considered it as six years for example and then divided it by the or divided by the annual production or the whole production and then we have the specific share which can be assigned to the product uh -huh. yeah okay. maybe um, in relationship to, to the, these targets what what's uh, as, um, which slide uh, well if, if in on slide nine but it's not, not important um, okay. you explicitly mention in your your objectives um, uh, ideally it would be also following the planetary boundary concept concept um, do you have very very concrete ideas on how you could fit your your sustainability cone into this in, concept. Uh, in that concept um, yeah that's uh, that's actually a discussion I wanted to avoid but um, <laughs> 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 um, no but it's because it's not basically it's not really the scope of my thesis because it's mm -hmm. it's about how to have global targets how can we assign these to individual products and currently um, science-based targets is trying to solve this with five to seven different methods and different companies are, are trying to apply it and they're struggling. And so I was thinking, okay, there's a lot of manpower involved. I want to solve that. Mm -hmm. But they are thinking about how to implement um, planetary boundaries, carrying capacity and support for, for companies. And I think the next step would be for, for products. So product carbon footprint, all yeah. this. But it's, I don't have, I've thought about it, how to do it. Uh, but not in depth that I could um, mm -hmm. yeah, say how we should solve that. Because I wanted to do the target state from a car body and then allocate it down.
-hmm. it's, it's very interesting <laughs> for, for, com com for companies. Daimler is doing a lot now with WWF about this, mm -hmm. and yeah, so the companies are approaching this this idea of planetary boundaries or same time based targets. <coughs> Um, there's one other interesting interdependency in your work, and you said that the interdependencies of products and production mm -hmm. um, can be solved. And I was thinking about an example of um, lightweight design, for light lightweight light. design. Mm -hmm. For example, if you're thinking of um, hot formed steel, mm -hmm. you have a much higher energy demand during production, mm -hmm. but over the entire life cycle, it's less. due to uh, yeah. lower material input mm -hmm. and due to better use phase. Uh, you win at the end. Yeah. So that would yeah, that, that is happened in practice. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 was I actually just know the LCA from yeah. uh, I just would be interested <laughs> yeah. how yeah. that would be solved in your yeah. system. Yeah. If we say that um, <coughs> we would like to have another uh, forming process, whatever, and that we would like to re reduce it, the overall environmental footprint by 10% or 100 kilograms, whatever. Um, we can say, okay, this car body um, in overall gets, gets a target of 100 kilograms. And then the weight-induced consumption of the, of, the, uh, of the car body, mm -hmm. yeah, we have to consider this as well in the, in the life cycle target of the car body. So that means because we have a very heavy, um, very heavy um, car body, we emit we cause 1.4 tons over the life cycle. Yeah? And if we now have a lighter car body, this one will be reduced, and we have more budget here for the production. Yeah? So okay. that is the, the holistic approach. OK, we're going to have a target for a lightweight designed car body, 300 kilograms, and then we can identify which are the main, main flows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is based on historic data, by the way. I, I use some historic data because you say, yeah. Um, maybe switching to a, to a completely different uh, topic. Um, I, I first zoom out a bit, and then we get to mm. the more um, um, yeah. yeah things directly related to, to things you have uh, developed in your thesis. Um, there, um, there is an entire paradigm shift ongoing in, uh, in manufacturing industry mm -hmm. uh, with this concept of, of industry 4.0. Um, maybe first, as a very general question, um, how do you see that this paradigm shift could be used uh, to to improve the uh, the environmental performance or reduce environmental impact of that that well highly Company automated product, manufacturing yeah. uh, industry. Can you can you give some some mm. examples? Uh, yeah. So industry 4.0 somehow covers um, digitalization and efficiency improvements and so forth. And one part would be the factory of the future concept. Mm -hmm. And there uh, it states that uh, we should improve the environmental um, profile of, of um, production because it might be a competitive advantage um, for European factories. So um, I would say if we think about the whole environmental improvement under the Industry 4.0 concept, we could use this um, to somehow supply s sufficient data how we can achieve this and how we can actually, we can use this as well in, in the digitalization process, like I said before with the PLM systems and, and so forth. So it's a kind of combination between the digitalization and more a better environmental performance. Mm -hmm. so. well, I, I see some, some, some practical uh, Issues, yeah? mm -hmm. possibilities also in the work that, that you have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, so where, where you're combining the, the simulation mm -hmm. Um, with with basically a concept of, of monitoring um, the the, uh, the the 
renewable energy mm. that is being produced, mm. um, uh, monitoring yeah. the needs yeah. for uh, in, storage in your, systems and so forth. Um, yeah, yeah in, the, in your manufacturing mm. and, and and simulating then what would be the best way mm. to to um, to schedule. Yeah. Uh, the production and so forth. So, so for me, this is a, a very good example of, of how some, some industry 4.0 concepts could be combined with the, the objective of, um, of reducing environmental impact. Yeah. But um, well, on the other hand, when I, when I look at the, the results um, mm. which, which you have in, in one of your papers, mm. um, then um, Basically, the, the reduction potential of that technology seems to be limited combined to the, the gain you have from just switching from, from the grid mm -hmm. uh, to, to, well, including more renewable energy sources. So yeah, then, it's, it's, again, it's, it's, is, is uh, there a lot of potential? Or? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally agree that the potential of integration of renewable energy mm -hmm. is, um, is, is a good idea. And, but I would say on long term, everyone is using renewable energy in production, mm -hmm. right? So th this is, there will be no discussion, I would say. And, but the question is how much of renewable energy, energy can we use uh, without sub-optimization? Sub and that is the idea of, of this paper. So if we, if we talk about, um, if we talk about this, this graph, for example, <coughs> we in, these are actually um, the absolute um, emissions here on the, on the y-axis. And then the little dots are per product, the results. But if we look here, that is the normal production um, um, based or fed by the German grid. We have 100% emissions and then we implement renewable energies and you can see that there's a lower amount of total emissions. But now we have to um, think about uh, the, the difference between these different scenarios. Here we have the maximum of, of renewable energies in the production, but in total we have higher emissions because we need additional storage to somehow cope with the volatile um, electricity provision. So to conclude um, is, or to make a, a conclusion, um, if we need more renewable energies, it's not always more beneficial. So it's a good uh, story about sub-optimization. Mm -hmm. So, and we, we were able to, to make this, uh, basically this, these whole bars, we added to the manufacturing simulation results. So it's a huge, it's, uh, it's 30, 35, it's more than 60% uh, of the overall carbon footprint mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. added on. So one of the answers would be that we should only produce um, when renewable energy is available to reduce the impact of, of the infrastructure we need. So, yeah. I think in, in the same paper, I think this is where you, where you, have, where you have to <coughs> say, you combine dynamic mm -hmm. simulation of manufacturing with the called static LCA. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, uh, you, you made a case study for renewable energy, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, think, I can see a point, a point in, in that which is really not about manufacturing, you could say. This is just about, this is just about uh, renewable, renewable energy. energy. Yeah. But, but if you look at the manufacturing and say, what does it bring to the results for the average car that you actually do a dynamic manufacturing simulation? Combine mm. that with your LCA. How does that affect the result? Of the, you say when you buy a car, mm. it's an average car. It's produced. I don't know. It can be produced any time. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. how does that impact on, on, on affect that? In in absolute terms, um, I would say. So okay, to begin a little bit. I just, uh, we we were able to um, derive the impact per product. Right? This is mentioned here with the dots. So instead of absolute reduction of the production facility, which our most manufacturing simulation guys are striving for, uh, we were able to, to make 
product-specific carbon footprints. There's the first result, right? If we, for example, um, we did this um, for the September, for September 2014, I think, and um, there was a lot of sun, less wind, and so forth, and we were able to, to have this carbon footprint here, but if we talk about a product which is produced in October, where it's less sun and more wind, what kind of effect does it have on the product? So we would like to have a product-specific carbon footprint. So that was possible with this combination. And the impact to the overall product, um, we can, we can um, calculate that based on this result of the functional unit. And the functional unit always relates to the superior level. So we can find ourselves um, now here somewhere if we say, okay, we've, um, we have calculated um, the carbon footprint of one cell here, uh, product specific wise, and then we, we compare it with a, with a budget we have assigned to, we can say, okay, in September, in September um, we can um, achieve this or uh, meet this target, in October we cannot meet this. So we should say, okay, in September we should ramp up the production to fulfill the target and uh, produce less in, in October. There's one, um, yeah. There's the kind of thinking, so, yeah. And, and are you thinking of using that kind of information for a communication to the customer? Because it would be difficult to say your employees that they have to stay at home in November <coughs> but work more in October. Mm -hmm. So the use would be that you can communicate to the user uh, of the car? To the final, yeah. Or that's, or that's okay, that is uh, then that's an issue of product her. declaration. <laughs> so um, I don't know if it's additional benefit, or if there's additional benefit for the customer, but um, it might be if you say, okay, we're going to produce now in, 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 in July a lot of cars, and we have almost zero carbon footprint because we can integrate a lot of sun, uh, sun um, energy. And if you want to buy this one, uh, you have less impact. And if you if you don't mind about the environmental impact, you can get a one one from December, whatever. So it might be an issue. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. And uh, but it might be an option to or additional marketing effect. Um, if you want to sell greener cars, you should produce it in in September or in August. And Volkswagen, for example, should put all the effort into the August and September, and yeah. Yeah, that's really yeah, the, yeah. Really tricky because you also identified that the production volume is really critical for the overall yeah. specific footprint. Yeah, yeah, so of course you, they almost, uh, or they should um, produce at their limits so to get um, the highest revenue. So there's not very, a lot of potential to increase the, the, the exactly. yeah. So that's, that's just a kind of trade-off. Maybe you, sh does it really make sense to have a, production line which can produce 400,000 cars in, in August and September and in average 250. And is it really worth to have additional infrastructure for that? And that is, yeah, that's the question we can maybe solve with this approach. Yeah, I, I haven't really thought about it, but it might be an option to, to have this, um, yeah. But if you, look, if you look away from it, so my, my impression mm. from, from, the, from your, your study here was that, that this renewable energy was just taken as an example mm. of what you could use it for. What, what else would you be able to use it for where it would make sense? Mm. Yeah, the question is... Um, if it's worth to have additional robots installed, for example, or what kind of robots should we use? Mm -hmm. So, um, because then you can, maybe the question would be, should we rather use two small robots instead of, of a large one? And we can identify the carbon footprint by this, for this specific robot, and see if it's additional um, 
environmental uh, or is it beneficial for the environmental impact and yeah I think yeah the choose of infrastructure or machinery might be another opportunity should we rather use one huge uh, battery or rather two small ones because you have to change them um, I would say two times during the production cycle should we reduce uh, change just one or just a big one so we can actually make these trade-offs yeah. Yeah. Could you go, go back to the, the slide you were shown with the results of the simulation uh, study? Uh, oh, yeah, I don't remember the, the, the slide number. <laughs> yeah. but, mm, so, oh, almost the last one. 60, so I'll remember 60. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, well, the, so, so, so the, the methods of, of integrating the, the simulations mm. and, the, uh, and the LCA is, is, is definitely interesting. Um, but of course, simulations always come with some, some uncertainty. They're, uh, they're approximations. Mm. Uh, do you have an idea of the, the order of magnitude of, of the uncertainty on the simulation results or mm. the overall analysis results? Yeah. So regarding the uncertainty of the manufacturing simulation, mm -hmm. um, um, it's based on a, on a PhD from Theo Brunswick, so I sh should can refer to this results. Um, but regarding the... the, the um, the manufacturing simulation was quite um, uh, exact because they um, combined or they actually measured it during September, right, the energy profile, and then along this energy profile or energy consumption, they developed the algorithm. So, and the match was pretty good. I saw these two graphs and they matched pretty good. So the uncertainty regarding the manufacturing simulation, I would say it was, it was quite short, so limited. Um, uncertainty and regarding the, the overhead consumption we used um, generic data and we were we are quite sure that there's some uncertainty because they hadn't measured it in, in the actual production we assumed some, some um, um, yeah, generic data and here we use um, data sets from EcoInvent and Garvey and always there's always some uncertainty involved but the main idea was in this paper to show that it's beneficial to combine these two to get um, additional information and avoid suboptimization. And we say in this paper, okay, that is just an example how we can use it, mm -hmm. and you don't really have to use these exact numbers. Yeah, it was about the application and integration of these systems. Mm -hmm. oh, but it's, it's also towards our future use. Yeah. Yeah. What are orders of magnitude of uncertainty yeah. you can you yeah. can expect from yeah. such uh, uh, yeah. methods? Yeah, that is a good question, but we haven't pinpointed out um, mm. and haven't looked at all the different uh, data sets. Yeah. No. But in general, I would say it, it works and gives d additional information. Yeah. So with the in-house production, you have focused on the um, life cycle phase where mm. we have the direct imp uh, control, let's mm. say, and the availability of all that data. Mm. Um, on the other side, <laughs> you have, you have shown with your pie diagrams and your thesis mm. that it's really a small portion of the life cycle impact of a yeah. car. Yeah. So um, do you see the possibility to transfer that approach with a, um, with a simulation um, for other life cycle phases where there is more uncertainty regarding the data availability but with a much higher impact so material mm. uh, production um, so le like category one of scope three and sca category yeah. 11 the use phase so where we have the really high impacts in a vehicle life can we apply the same methodology or an adopted me methodology mm. You mean this methodology here with... Yes, yeah, so yeah. combining LCA mm. with the simulation. 
Or let's mm. n let's start with another question. Is there a recommended in-house production depth, you would say, that you need at least? Uh, to, okay. So, yeah. So, um, is this yeah, only I've, in I've integrated this external and in, in also the vertical integration. Um, so, I've maximum. So, in the body shop, there's a high, high um, mm -hmm. in-house production. Mm -hmm. Only manure processes are, do, are done outside. So, um, there I would say um, it should be stay in-house. I know it's, it's a key competence. Um, but Ah, sorry. I, yeah, think, I, I didn't get I the, think I didn't phrase yeah, it right. Yeah. I meant, is there, you say that a car production has got a defined uh, in-house production depth. Yeah. Of course, there comes a lot from tier one, two, yeah. three suppliers, but um, there's also a lot of work done in-house. Yeah. And only then makes it sense to have that cone, because there's a... Mm, no. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, because um, using this cone, you are identifying um, targets. Um, which one was it again? 30. So we're always getting back to this one. Um, so we have a lot of information here, for example. So that's the discussion external, internal, mm -hmm. right? In this data sheet up here, they're saying, OK, we are getting some external um, products from um, and, and internal processes. So we can allocate this one to the external uh, partners. So we can put this one in the tender. And based on this, um, we are choosing the, uh, the, the tier one or tier two because they have to comply with it. And if they're not complying with it, mm -hmm. they are out of, this, uh, out of this tender. So that would be the idea how to integrate this. And um, yeah, and it's actually based on, on the existing data. So um, yeah, so vertical integration. So in-house, yeah, it's a complex. Yeah, but I understand your yeah. approach. Yeah. So, I, I'm, but I'm, still, yeah, it's, it's you know, you have the most um, um, precise data about uh, your own production. Yeah. And for your suppliers, it's already more a bit like a yeah, guess. Yeah, it's a bit, it's, uh, but here you can at least say, okay, I have a, assigned a target for you, and you should comply with it. Mm -hmm. So, otherwise, we cannot fulfill the, the upper target here, because we have enough to do here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's the opportunity how to um, add additional yeah, specifications in the tender. Yeah. yeah, act as a catalyzer in the whole supply yeah. chain. Okay, yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah, and then of course it starts again. They have their own production system and their own production line, and so they have to integrate it. So mm -hmm. the one yeah starts here as well, and then yeah push it down. But that is what is done with the with the cost as well, yeah. right? So. So it's quite similar, and they should be, yeah. Slide 60 again? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no in, in, in one of your papers, you, you explicitly refer to the fact, well, there, there's not only the environmental uh, issue, um, there's uh, also the, um, the, the, show, the, the social and the, the, mm. the, the economic um, cost issues and so forth. Um, You're referring to paper one, or? Um, yes, I'm, I'm referring to... Um, yeah, one of the later papers, I think. Well, anyhow, okay. the um, so basically, um, as I read it there, you say the, the same concept can be used for for the different pillars. Mm. Um, I was wondering, yes, a bit, bit more philosophical, maybe, but um, if you want to apply this to okay. to social LCA, <laughs> how far I do you get? it later. <laughs> 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 um, I think it's not in, not possible. Mm -hmm. I would say it's you have to. If you talk about social as aspects, it's not really 
it's not qualitative, it's not quantitative. So um, therefore, yeah, you have to put numbers on, on social activities. So that's, that's a big issue. And if you talk about social life cycle assessment, it's still an ongoing research. So and if you want to implement this here, it's a bit tricky, I would say. And I don't know if it's, it's feasible. But so it's definitely a limitation that I haven't looked at um, the social aspects here in particular and described how, why I included it. But I'd say it's, it's a problem of quantitative versus qualitative approach. Um, I, I definitely think uh, this, is, this is one of the, the issues. Mm -hmm. But even when it gets down to the, the more quantitative um, aspects, like um, working hours well, and, yeah, and, and days of, uh, yeah. of, of, of child labor, mm. uh, well, splitting up a target on child labor. You can only <laughs> employ one child quite, there. Quite tricky. No. <laughs> um, but, but maybe this, this relates more to something on, on an organizational yeah. level. Um, yeah, that is actually, so this is product or production related and the decisions about social aspects are all, most of the time made on organizational level. So, um, but, but, but <laughs> Volkswagen, for example, I think have decided not to employ any child. And so that is, a, so. Yeah, <laughs> so that is an organization, organizational issue. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and how to... If they yeah. said, okay, we don't have any child employed here, I don't really have to set a yeah. target for this. No. But on the other hand, and, and then we're, we're getting back to, to where we started the discussion more than, uh, than an hour ago, um, is, is well, maybe there's also a number of things uh, related to it, the environment that are mm. more at the organizational mm. level. Um, and that, that yeah, could, could have some problems fitting in the concept of the so of the for example or? what kind of parameters or what kind of impacts do you mean it's like eutrophication more local effects or um it's more the causes of if you would sorry it's more, more like the overhead for example yeah, <laughs> yeah. what do you say like like the overhead the overhead uh, yeah it's like uh, yeah of course the overhead differs uh, from from site production side to side if we talk about uh, the production in India, for example, um, they have no overhead um, consumptions because there are no regulations regarding the, the average temperature they should have in the production facility. Mm -hmm. While in, in Germany, they need a heating and ventilation overhead because they have to be between 20 and 21 degrees, the mm -hmm. working conditions. Right? So, uh, of course, there are site-specific things. But that is why I focus on European conditions, okay. and yeah. Oh. But on the other hand, in in India, for example, it's a huge is issue uh, with the temperature change, because the robots are only working or having the accuracy between a different um, range, temperature range. Okay. And if it's 45 degrees in the production, which can e easily be uh, reached there, you have less accuracy. So the product quality somehow suffers due to that. But you have less energy consumption. So you have to decide product quality versus environmental impact. Yeah. That could be a discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Further on then line actually with different impacts. Now you have worked only with carbon dioxide. Equivalent. <laughs> so what, what do we do when we have at least the five others that you yeah, mentioned. mentioned yeah. 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 Uh, what should we do? So first of all, um, I would say they are, we should have more, um, or we should know how the different components behave in terms of the different impact categories. I've looked for, for several life cycle um, studies um, for the different um, uh, levels but there are no real um, results available. So robots-wise and technology-wise, there are. But if we talk about the whole production line, there are, there are no results. So I have actually um, no clue how it behaves. But I think if we conduct a lot of LCAs around uh, on these different levels, we, can, we are able to, to adapt this approach to, to other ones. 
uh, to other input categories. And yeah. but equal weighting or equal weighting of the different um, input categories. Nope, I'm not a big fan of of equal <laughs> uh, of not uh, of different weighting. So I, I should say we should have five different results. Okay. So I think yeah. A single score is always uh, quite handy for managers, but I don't know. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, I think, five figures plus additional life cycle costs um, <laughs> is still <laughs> possible to understand for managers. Plus technical is measures, plus, <laughs> yeah. plus technical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, this is, with but this is on another slide. Account, uh, <laughs> yeah. They're already yeah. not that happy to yeah. have no. to include. Yeah, but I think uh, if, if the managers are getting now CO2 emissions, CO2 equivalents, primary energy demand or energy demand and costs, they're quite happy. And yeah, the next um, step would be to implement other impact categories. I'm quite aware because if you develop this, you might sub-optimize. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah. And yeah, resource consumption is, is a huge issue, I would say, um, especially if we talk about electrified cars, mm -hmm. right, with additional um, 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 rare earth and so forth. We have to think about this as well. But car body-wise, it's not so important so far. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But this leads me to another question. You, s you mentioned that you extracted the data yourself that you needed for the allocation of the targets mm -hmm. for the target setting. And um, I was wondering or was thinking about that there are also interrelations of different car components. So the weight of s some major components will lead to how um, about how we, which motor do we need mm -hmm. um, the they are, the other components are also weight dependent. Mm. Um, that uh, means, and we've already seen for your example, that there are different options regarding lightweight uh, materials mm. and so on. How do you already have an idea how companies should cope with that vast, vast amount of um, information that is needed to answer all those questions mm. and to, to look at all those possible scenarios mm. they have to be uh, or Aware, to yeah. look at, yeah. at all those different levels of um, mm. Detail. Yeah. So if we talk about, um, uh, actually, I have actually thought about this in, in a different case, like um, because this data is basically from Daimler, more or less, all the background, and they produce on the same line um, the C class and um, C class for Europe and for for America. And if we talk about American regulation, there has to be more stiffness in the front of the car. Otherwise, it will not be, uh, it cannot be sold in America. So they're actually producing two different car bodies in this line, and it somehow leads to the same question. So we have different variants, and how do you assess this? Right? So you'd have, so weight dependent or motor mm -hmm. dependent, um, proportional uh, system dependent car body structure. And um, in this algorithm, you can actually assign how many products or intermediate products are needed to fulfill the upper level. So in terms of the American car body, you have a higher impact factor or activity factor for the American car because you de in, uh, need an additional intermediate product to fulfill the functional unit of the, of the upper le level. By this, we can allocate the impact between the different products as well. Yeah. And, and where in the system do you find the information about all the different technical opportunities or variants? Um, yeah. Variations? Um, this was slide number. <coughs> slide number. So, so basically, you can find it here because um, you have. Here in this description of this process, it says, not in this specific one, but it says, okay, we're going to produce two different variants on this line. And therefore, we need this intermediate products. And then in the next stage, you can say, okay, this cell is only used for product one, and the other cell is only used for product two. So then we can even split the, the target from here to product one and product two. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and, and so um, do I have to imagine that then there in the production planning and so on there are people uh, knowing how to do LCA and they calculate all the different no, options? No, the, the, the idea is um, to actually just use the whole information in these PLM systems, which is already available. We, we went mm -hmm. to Jalapia, yeah, for example, and we had a look at the PLM systems. And they actually have small fields which are blank with white, the weight of the, of the product, with the dimension of the product, mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. They only have to fill in this information. But they are not uh, interesting so far. So okay. they, they're just leaving it out. It's everything available, more or less, besides the joining equivalents. Mm -hmm. They're not implemented so far. That was quite surprising that everything is already there and mm -hmm. they're not using it. Even the kilowatt hours, you can have it there. Okay. They just want to know how the design is looking like and if the product flow works. Yeah, well, that was also one of my questions here. So how, how, will this, how long time does it take to gather all this data that you need to, to do it? And is mm -hmm. it uh, how many parameters? No, how, many, how, how long time does it take? Yeah. So far, it took three and a half years. Yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, uh, no, but... They uh, have for some lines, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. just for some lines. And um, yeah, I would say the next big step is to somehow sell the idea to the software developers and make them aware, okay, that might be a competitive edge for your software. And that is what we are trying with, with Delphoy, the company. They want to integrate <coughs> this thinking. And I think it's a huge competitive edge, but you need to have some workshop with them and say, that is how we can do it. And you didn't need additional data. And if you want to even be more um, detailed, or um, you should rather have this factor as well. They, they, they are developing. And I think you have a, a weekly or monthly meeting with, with Delphoy. Still, no? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thinking of your um, paper resource simulation, there was one message that the results mainly depended on the uh, production numbers and on the choice of, of energy mix. Mm -hmm. So do you think that companies are already ready for your uh, degree of detail or would they say we should shift our um, power plant mm -hmm. um, from, let's say, from coal to gas and mm -hmm. then we have reached really a milestone? Yeah. Are they already at that point that they can go into that detail? Or I think they are not ready for it. So I'm a little bit I'm a step ahead, I would say. Um, but of course, the low-hanging fruits at the moment, uh, yeah, from coal to gas, um, might be might, yeah, might, might be an option, of course. But on long term, they should think about the changing of their of the view. So they should think about more the product related emissions, not the overall product and uh, the emissions from their from their factory. Because they want to sell they want to sell um, the functionality, right? So everything should be more product related. And yeah, there's already some legislative yeah. pressure on the product <laughs> yeah. you could say. Yeah. So regarding the tape pipe emissions. Uh, I think that is a way to provide good information for, for the next step uh, mm -hmm. for the car companies. So how to relate all this to a final product. And yeah. mm -hmm. but today, I think they're not uh, ready for it. It's a bit, uh, well, let's see yeah. where I end up. <coughs> and, yeah. So how is the question eagerness? <laughs> <laughs> Are you keen? <laughs> um, you say when, when you reach the point where you're fishing for questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me know. I would have one more, but then it would be fine for me. For I mean, it's fine. Okay, all right. Okay. No, 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 please, please go ahead. <laughs> 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 no, it was just, re you were referring to the science-based targets, and of mm. course, that are moving targets. Mm. And you've said in your stage gate model mm. that, let's say, four years before point of production or start of production, mm. 
there you have that decision. Mm. But as we know that then perhaps there's a yearly um, carbon dioxide reporting of the mm. companies and that there are um, those moving targets from the mm. science-based initiative or target initiative, mm. um, is there or do you see a chance to still later um, adapt to those moving targets? It's not that static. So mm -hmm. the, there's not only the, the manufacturing mm. uh, moving, but also the targets. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, ah. So yeah, the question. Mm. Um, okay, it's it's a kind of proactive approach, I would say, for for the organization. So if you have these target state of 390 gigaton CO2 equivalents and they somehow allocate the share to Volkswagen in 2016, that is what's gonna, gonna happen, that Volkswagen gets allowance for, for this amount of CO2 emissions in 2015. They, the guys at Volkswagen should know how it develops in the next five years, I would say, because the overall allowance um, CO2 emissions will be reduced by 2.5% to meet the target. So they can assume, okay, I, we should reduce our allowance by this amount as well. And then we can say, okay, in five years, our car will be produced. We should meet this target, and this broken down on the different variants means this to us. So it's so a kind of strategy development. So. Yeah, I've, yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, um, because but they actually know how how many cars they will sell in, in <coughs> five years. So, I think they can reduce their allowance by 2.5 percent if it's the target from science-based target, and if they want to be uh, um, even more. Uh, environmental friendly, they can say, okay, we want to reduce 5% because it's a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. We want to be the greenest uh, company, so let's do it. And we set this target, mm -hmm. and it actually, it, it will fulfill the science-based target. Yeah, by another mag yeah. magnitude, so. Okay. Yeah. Steve? What is the status of your papers? The status of your papers the is... July. 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 Have you submitted any of them? Um, paper two is it's a discussion about uh, financing because uh, we are to uh, have chosen a, a journal which uh, wants to have 60 euros per page, so I was not able to, to get this money. And paper two is yeah is ready to submit, but yeah, frankly speaking, I after I submitted the um, PhD. I went on holiday and applied for some jobs, and then, yeah, but now uh, I've talked to Michael later, and yeah, we will push it now. Yeah. Yeah. Because all of them are, are ready to submit, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, all the authors have uh, commented, and all our um, comments are implemented, so they're ready to submit. Yeah. Yes. Cool. I think we are there. Um, I have to get up again. Okay. Um, yes, that was uh, entertaining. <laughs> what you meant. <laughs> you always learn something at, at new uh, at PSD defense because it's all new knowledge. Oh. I like the cone idea. Thank you. It, it might be refined a little, but I like it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's. <laughs> Work in progress, right? <laughs> um, yeah. The procedure from here is that the assessment committee will now prepare a final <coughs> recommendation. I don't know if you're planning to do that today already, but I guess you have a little time yes. to do a bit early. That recommendation, they hopefully, or at least Steve, as uh, head of the assessment committee, will uh, <coughs> come around at a reception and uh, give you a preview of what that looks like by reading <laughs> it out uh, mm -hmm. so that you have an idea how it all Went. Okay. I'm not going uh, to read it out. Okay. No. <laughs> not the whole it's two pages. Not, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's actually supposed to be quite short. So, anyway. <laughs> too, too, too much work? Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. I, I can explain that uh, uh, afterwards. But um, then 
uh, your final degree will be awarded by the dean on behalf of the Jewish Academic Council. So even though they write a recommendation, the dean might choose to do something else. He never does, but he can. <laughs> I never liked him. <laughs> Maybe I liked him. But uh, based on that, I here now prepare your PhD defense as included. And thank you all for showing up. Audience, examiners, and defendant, of course. Yeah. Thank you.